Hello, and welcome to this presentation on digital signatures. To set the stage, we're going to talk about something called symmetric key cryptography. What is symmetric key cryptography? Symmetric key cryptography is actually an aptly named communication technique where you have the same key on both sides. And what you're going to do with this key is you're going to encrypt the message so that you can communicate securely over a potentially unsecured channel. A really good example of this is military usage, which dates back millennia, right? This idea that a general may need to communicate with another general before the age of computers. So if this general wanted to communicate with another general, but was worried that the message would get intercepted along the way or be read by anyone they don't want to read the message, what they could do is they could establish a key beforehand that only the generals have. So in this way, the generals could encrypt the message to the other general and the other general could decrypt it on the other end. So a really good example of this is the classic Caesar cipher where you have a message like the one below, cat, and the encrypted version of that is FCX. The way you get to the encrypted version of that is by using the key, which would be established on both ends of the communication. The key in this case is 324. What you would do is you would take the letter C, you would translate it over three characters to the right. So C becomes D, becomes E, becomes F. A becomes B, becomes C. Because A is going to shift over two characters, and C is going to shift over three characters, and then T finally is going to shift over four characters. That's why it becomes X. So we go from cat to FCX. What's going to happen on the other end of the communication is the general is going to then shift those characters back by way of that same key and end up with the original message, cat. So a really good example of symmetric key cryptography in today's digital era is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. This is used to, uh, to secure our communication across the web. A really big downside of symmetric key cryptography that we're going to come back to in just a moment is that both sides must have the key beforehand. So if you were trying to communicate with a stranger over the internet that you've never talked to before, this would be really hard to do securely with symmetric key cryptography, right? Because if you exchange keys over a potentially unsecured network, you would be concerned that somebody would intercept those keys. But if you had met up beforehand, you could exchange those keys in you know, in person and know that nobody had intercepted that communication. So if Bob and Alice want to communicate securely, maybe they had met up beforehand and they exchanged keys and they have the same keys on both ends and they could use those keys to communicate securely over a protocol that they are concerned might have eavesdroppers. So let's talk about asymmetric key cryptography or what is more commonly referred to as public key cryptography. Asymmetric key cryptography was born of an inspiration by a cryptographer known as Whit Diffie. Whit Diffie had this idea to split the key in two, which was heresy in the field of cryptography. This was something that Whit Diffie came up with as sort of this lightning bolt of inspiration and explained to other researchers who sort of laughed him out of the room and said, no, 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 you don't split the key in two. The concept is you keep your keys private. You never create a second key that other people can then hold on to. But what if you had this idea that if you take the keys, the uh, if you take a key and you split it into into a public key and a private key and you put your key in the public domain, you could potentially unlock some interesting use cases. These interesting use cases would be to be able to authenticate where you have one key signs and the other one verifies. In this case, the one that signs would be the private key. So I would sign a message with my private key and then you could verify with my public key that that message came from me without knowing my private key. Similarly, there's the encryption use case where you could take my public key, you can encrypt a message using my public key and only I can decrypt it using my private key. So what if he said, it'd be really interesting if we had something called a public key and we call it public key cryptography, right? Um, and so this is where this inspiration came from. Of course, they had to research a mathematical function that could actually support this. And there's a few different mathematical functions and crypto systems that do this today. Uh, if you want to learn more about public key cryptography, I can't recommend stronger the book Crypto by Stephen Levy. This gives a really good historical perspective on how this inspiration came to be. So with public key cryptography, the first 
use case we're going to talk about is encryption. With encryption, what happens is Bob, the character over on the left hand side here, the blue character, is going to have a public key and they're going to provide it to Charlie, who's over there on the right hand side. So Bob is going to say, here's my public key, Charlie. And Charlie is going to, you know, potentially have the public key along with many other people. Bob is going to secure his private key and make sure that nobody else gets a hold of that private key. What Charlie can then do is encrypt a message only Bob can read with Bob's private key. Even if Eve intercepts this message down there in the middle, even if Eve intercepts that message, Eve cannot read it because only Bob can decrypt it with Bob's private key. So what ends up happening here is Bob is happy and Eve is frustrated. Uh, because only Bob can read what Charlie sent to Bob. So the second use case we need to talk about is authentication. This is going to be the one that's much more pertinent to us in this course, where Bob starts with his public key and he provides it to the network and then he secures his private key. And again, Bob needs to make sure that nobody else gets a hold of his private key. Bob signs a message with his private key and provides it to the network. Now, anyone with Bob's public key can verify that the message was indeed signed by Bob. This is going to be very similar to how we're going to look at this in Web3. So when you uh, sign a transaction with your private key and you broadcast it to a blockchain, the blockchain nodes can recover that public key from the signature, which is going to have the user's address, uh, which is going to allow them to derive the user's address. So you sign a message. That message gets broadcast to these nodes in the network over here on the right. And then those nodes can say, yes, that is this person who authenticated this message. And this is how we are able to get authentication in a public network like a blockchain. Next, what I want you to do is get used to these cryptographic primitives by trying them out. Take some of the exercises below and learn more about public key cryptography.